instead of uh, having uh, uh, Andrew do all, all the things I do, I'll do it now. <laughs> <laughs> no, professors are often defined by their students as people who talk in their sleep. And uh, one of my students is actually here blogging away, uh, so I'll be keeping a sharp eye on the, on the blog output. Can you hear me? Yeah? Okay, at the back? Good. So my data, I'll, talk, I'll be talking about that today and what, 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 why we think it's exciting and actually quite disruptive. In my day job is as a professor at Southampton. Actually, I advise the government in a number of roles. Mostly, I... You know, spend my time, not paid by government, but advising them. And this began with work that Tim Berners-Lee and I did under the last government to get public data made available and open for reuse. Tons and tons of data sits neglected or behind the kind of civil service kind of mental firewall. And getting it out there was the job that we were set by the last government. And actually this coalition has taken that forward with, uh, with real vigour. And now you can get your monthly uh, reported crime data down to the street level. You can get spending above £500 for every local authority in the country. You can get uh, data on infection rates in hospitals. It's been transformed and it's brought me into contact with the realities of making policy and getting politicians to, to understand the opportunities in this data-enabled world. And although we may occasionally despair of the public services and procurement through the public services, it is where some of the most foundational and important data is. And we need to support, encourage, and enhance that capability uh, uh, throughout. Um, which is why, actually, the, another role is um, Berners-Lee and I are both involved in setting up what we call the Open Data Institute, which will be launching in October in Shoreditch, um, in, in the Tech City area, to essentially look for value in open data, essentially the business models and uh, um, encouraging startups and corporations of all sizes to look at these resources as a new class of asset. But today, it's my data I want to talk about. Um, you might think, you know, what, what my data with an I? Uh, you might think of this as a little representation of the individual struggling to get their data back. Actually, my data with a Y is a cable company in Sweden, and Her Britannic Majesty didn't feel it could take on a cable company in Sweden, so it's uh, <laughs> my data. <laughs> um, but you've seen these kinds of visualizations before. I always like to start off with a bit of um, eye candy around data visualization, because I, I love this stuff. Um, that might look like a light pollution from, uh, from, uh, from, a, from, from a high altitude satellite. In fact, each of those points of luminosity it's an interesting piece of personally generated open data. It's a Flickr geo-coordinate. So when you upload a, a, a photo to Flickr, one of those points of light is the geo-coordinate. Uh, so what? Well, actually, there's an awful lot of richness in that data, and you don't even have to have the analytics of all the world on hand to see structure in it. That is where we are. That is the Thames, those are the bridges across it, those are the main thoroughfares, those are the Flickr geocoordinates for a sample of Flickr upload data. And why is that interested? interesting? Because A, that's been given to us by the public uploading their photos, and of course they've done something else interesting. They've tagged all those photos, so I can immediately see the top tourist sites with virtually no effort at all, a tiny bit of processing. And the point, of course, as you will know well, is data comes in all shapes and sizes, big, small, medium, open, closed, personal, non-personal. The trick is to see the structure and understand when and what might be the opportunity there. Uh, and that's just a lovely example. Anyway, back to the, back to the challenge <coughs> that my data has, which is quite bold in a way. This is a piece of work that was um, initiated through uh, BIS, Business, uh, Business Innovation and Skills, and the Cabinet Office. And they produced a white paper last year called Better Choices, Better Deals. The fundamental proposition is customers, consumers, you and I in our consumer roles, customer uh, contexts, we are living in a world where more data will allow us to make better decisions, be more informed, get better services, exert more control. The kind of customer journey we all as companies and organizations want to take our customers on, for sure. Well, how to do that? Well, the plan, the ambition, the thought is this world of personal 
data, which currently consists of a world which is largely managed by brokers, credit reference agencies who are data processors over our credit transactions or whatever, or the companies who collect data about their customers, the loyalty cards and the rest of it, these are understood. This is the world that is coming and this is the world in which individuals will have much more control over their data and not just over it but collecting and managing it and having the means to give permission based access to other third party aggregators to do interesting things with it. Why is that? Well, partly through programs like My Data in the UK and a program called Smart Disclosure in the US, but also because that's the world we're getting used to as we have possession of our music and our films on devices close to us. The government's committed to your health records in the UK being available to you personally by the end of this parliament. Hmm. Um, we'll see how that goes. Because a new personal ecosystem is emerging, one in which we're all seeking, we all understand about ID and claims verification, or we all understand about um, handbacks, uh, personal informatics, information about my life, the entire emergence of life logging, which is the idea, and you see it in companies like Apple, iBook, iPhotos, iLife, they want to take you on a lifelong journey as you catalogue your experience in photos, journals, data, transactions. But of course, it's your data. Personal data management. What is the ecology going to look like and the ecosystem going to look like in which these sorts of data, including the one that is most sought after? And I often refer to this as the move to not just capturing data about a person's behavior or their attention. You know, what are they looking at on the screen real estate at the moment or what click-throughs have they done? Yeah, yeah. but what's their intention? What do they intend to do? Because that is their mother load. That's the thing that will discriminate real insight. Why are they looking at that, this page with what intention? And what kind of status will this data have? Who will control it? How will it be balanced? So, the space we see is one in which existing mar markets like this will get supplemented by quite new markets of individuals managing their own data and in these worlds, from decision support services to life management systems, there will, of course, be entirely new opportunities to glue vertically these data insights together. Now, this is a, it's a vision, but I think we see it emerging. As people have always said, you know, the future is here. It's just unevenly distributed. And in certain segments, we start to see it coming through. How do we empower that to happen more quickly? Well, you might not think that government has anything to do for th with this, um, but sometimes it can be the agent for setting up the conditions, particularly in a medium-sized developed country like the UK, somewhat centralised, has the conditions for trying to get an environment that can support and promote um, an emergent class of activity or behaviour or business. So, the vision is that if we can enable the consumer to get their data from the retail high street, from the financial transactions, from their utilities, from their telcos, this way, and not notice just the individual, but crowds, collections of individuals who share something in common. For example, the common interest in getting together to try and see if they could get a deal on their utility bill being reduced by collectively purchasing their gas rather than having to go and get a deal one at a time. Or indeed, very large crowds of individuals. Because if I return the data to the individual, they may form an alliance with a larger group or an even larger group to achieve some common purpose with their information. Or a third party might provide that capability. So, this all looks like a one-way transaction. Of course, the real truth is, at the moment, the transaction is all the other way. You know, we have this massive information asymmetry in all our lives in which our data is collected by business, by the state, and that's it. Thanks very much, guys. We'll do the analytics, we'll do the micro-segmentation, and, and. But in this world, where you try and rebalance the symmetry, you actually, the argument goes, affect a much deeper potential conversation. So the empowered consumer just doesn't 
tart themselves off to the next slowest utility provider for the day, but actually we'll have all sorts of conversations with providers around. My context, what my purchasing intentions are potentially, questions I have, what I might be planning to do, my plans and priorities. This is the goal that all companies are after. With a two-way communication channel based around the data that suppliers might have and companies might have, this is a new kind of information and data-driven conversation. And it largely doesn't exist because, frankly, businesses are just like governments. They think it's their data, they'll hang on to it, and that's good. They've got an incumbent position, they're getting their insights. What needs disrupting? Well, I'm here to tell you it's going to get disrupted. And it is getting disrupted. So from transaction histories, which we understand, to simple things like warranties and insurances. Imagine, imagine a service where all those bloody warranties on all those physical receipts and tills was actually an ar arbitrated single service where I get a, a dashboard that would manage all those warranties because the warranties were in a form that I could get back. They were machine readable. They had an open license. I could get to work on them. And what applies for warranties applies for a whole range of, of other opportunities here. So, a new data information sharing uh, relationship with customers. It doesn't exist, or if it does exist, it exists in very limited fragments. So some banks will give you back your account details, and you might feel you have sort of an interaction over them. Some tools are giving you insights as to your financial habits and spreads. But that's kind of a bilateral deal. What if the assumption was that you would get your data back routinely from people who held it on you, to you, securely, in an unrestrictive, machine-readable format? We know that's the key to breaking down the silos in enterprises. Why shouldn't it be with customers? So here's an example, one that we got underway. We, the, the My Data program launched uh, last year, and, uh, and in November, the then um, uh, minister in charge of this at Biz was, was Ed Davey, who's now the Secretary of State of Energy and Climate Control. We launched this, and we had about 26 uh, uh, big companies signed up to adopt a voluntary code to make progress on getting this stuff released. Now, that's, it's a big thing to take on. And what we did in the program was we divided those interests up into sectors. And one very coherent sector, because there are essentially six big providers, gas, electricity, okay, utilities. So the big six, and about every November, the big six are asked, what's happening to your tariffs? Why has your bills gone up? You know, people are cold. Uh, there's an issue. Um, they become a little bit under the spotlight. And the thought was that was an interesting group to get together and deal with them. If anything ought to have a relatively transparent tariff code or not suffer quite so much from um, obfuscation marketing, it might be gas and electricity. Well, you'd be surprised, of course, in fact, there are thousands of different tariff variations. So getting to an agreement on a common terminology to just describe your gas or electricity bill, one that would be transportable, um, has been work that's been ongoing. But um, all six have signed up to this, and at this time, uh, three or four of them have actual data released back, available, not widely understood or deployed yet, I have to say, um, and one of the challenges here is, is how do, what app do you get this data back to? You know, where are the iPhone apps that allow you to, to have this uh, uh, frictionless exchange? Uh, just an example of that. And there's also then the cry from government about what all the people about the people who don't have the Apple smartphones and the Samsung Galaxies and so on. Well, actually, this isn't megabytes of data we're talking about. We're talking about your monthly consumption or your daily consumption, if you've got a live feed in there, smart metering, all these kinds of ideas around. But what about, what about, what about, what about just your gas bill? Just put a QR code on your gas bill that would contain almost all the information you need, okay? Because the slog in all this stuff, as we've seen data released back that's not in a machine-readable way, is the data re-entry overhead. Nobody ever wants to do that. And in fact, uh, we have a good example of that coming up. So energy has been up on the game here. And actually, we're seeing already third parties begin to come in 
with offerings, with software, that, uh, with apps that allow you to compare and contrast in this space. In the US, this initiative is called Green Button, and there are uh, 12 million households, uh, allegedly, on the, on the West Coast who have access to consolidated data in this space, which they can then use to monitor efficient energy usage. There isn't, in some regards, quite the same competitive space of six suppliers that we have the choice between here, so it's going to be a different market in the UK, but an interesting one. And the beginnings of this change, because, well, because, here's an example. This was announced um, early summer, 38 Degrees and Witch got together, and they launched this campaign called The Big Switch. It attracted a lot of attention. They had hundreds of thousands of people signing up to essentially pool themselves into similar groups and go and run a reverse auction, essentially, against the uh, providers to get the best deal, to get discounts on gas electricity. The power of the purchaser, you might think, okay. And about 40, 50,000, I believe, actually made the switch off the back of this. One of the big drop-offs was, of course, that the formats for getting the data back still required you to get all of that and then retype it back into the actual online tool that would submit back to which in 38 degrees. That transcription process just kills uptake. It's all about removing the friction. It's all about common standards so that you can, and, and the sign-on process so that it can be essentially seamless. But I think we'll see a lot more of this. As more data becomes available, uh, you're going to see a, a lot more of this, of this start to cut into action. But there are other examples. There's called Credits Noddle, which is, which is essentially giving data around uh, credit reference data back for free to users, to clients, to consumers, on the proposition that rather than charging out for this, there are all sorts of other services that can be offered back to the consumer on essentially a freemium model that is saying, yep, we're giving you this basic insight to your ref credit reference data, your transaction data, because there are other services of higher value we want to sell you. Yep, 15 quid a month is nice for a credit reference, but actually there's a much richer vein of value to be resourced here. Or indeed the Bill Monitor site, which is the Oxford company, who will take your phone tariffs and usually explain to you that about 30% of it is not used ever, okay, and try and marry you up to a tariff that better fits your usage. But that, again, is still in an era in which the overhead for this company in scraping the various websites, the telcos, for the tariff rates, for the actual um, price cost at any one time, is a massive overhead. And companies say, well, you know, why should we make that easier? Why should we make that easier? Because we've got these people captured in great deals and we've got a 30% margin. And, yeah. But actually, in truth, the markets that have made machine accessibility for their sector a capability have always grown. Example I use is the airline ticket industry, which once upon a time would do cease and desist letters against those companies that try to scrape the airline sites for fees and tariffs and timetables. They kind of woke up to the fact that actually if more people knew the fees and tariffs and timetables, they might all collectively get more business. And there's one of the strong principles around this is that Opening up as a sector, getting the data back to the consumer, builds the market, doesn't shrink it. So in my data, what we've been proposing is this, what we call the TACT process. It's a, it's a four-stage process from being transparent, granting access, enabling control, and ultimately transfer back. And in a sense, this is a journey. And I would submit that a lot of companies ought to seriously be thinking about this piece of it, not least because one of the immediate added values for this process is, is reputational enhancement. And we've got principles. We've got eight principles. They all look high-minded and great, but these are kind of echo the principles we're seeing in the open data movement as well, which is that, you know, this is what we're after, that data should be released to customers in reusable, machine-readable formats using an open standard. Now, that's a big top-level principle. And if that was implemented, the My Data Vision that I've been describing would really begin to accelerate away. We've done it by sector, we've got a lot of interest, and indeed sufficiently so that the government has, uh, has, has, has actually launched a, uh, a consultation that I'll come on to in a minute. Um, people say, well, you know, it's all very well asking uh, 
companies for their consumer data, but what about government? And it's absolutely true. Government, I, you know, we've got to the stage of getting government to cough up the non-personal data, but what about the data that's about us? I mean, look at the state of the information we can get back in health, education, tax, welfare. You know, there is no reason at all why government shouldn't be put exactly into the same position and the same requirement. And, of course, the real value is mixing those public service personal data sets with the, with the private sector. Imagine welfare, heating credits associated across to a utility provider. You know. Again, the kind of frictions you might take out of the system if you could associate medical records with a whole set of potential uh, private provision. And we see this world beginning to emerge. We call it the personal data asset revolution. And no matter how big your interest in big data, this class of data is going to be huge, simply because in sum, the aggregate total of the personal infosphere that we'll be carrying about will be, will be very large indeed. And if you begin to look at the kind of thought pieces around this, it's because Control Shift, a, a consultancy that specializes in, in, in thinking uh, and researching this whole area of personal information empowerment, to the World Economic Forum's report of, um, of what they call this personal asset class revolution, you can see the, 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 the direction of travel. And most interestingly, this consultation uh, was opened just in the summer. And this is a proposal by the government to actually give a power to the Secretary of State to actually require holders of large amounts of personal data held in electronic format to provide that back to the consumer. So this would actually uh, be a very interesting development. It wouldn't apply to every business of all shape and size. It would only apply to certain classes of data. It wouldn't apply to the analytics would apply to the basic data. The, the idea being that it's the transaction data that if the consumer has it, they can get their own analytics done on that to some extent uh, 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 with a group or a crowd. So this is a, 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 a consultation that just closed actually and, uh, and uh, we'll be looking to see how this policy gets shaped. And taking a power isn't of course the same as, as deploying it. So at this stage, I think it's the notion that we really would like business to re-empower the consumer. Are you listening? We really would like business. And so, and we'll see how far we get with that conversation. The ecosystem that's emerging is an interesting one because it's not just about government throwing data out there. We'll see increasingly, I think, uh, business data where businesses ask themselves, what data could we mix into here? Some of it closed, some of it open. Um, what of our data assets serve us better if it's openly declared for a larger part of the data uh, environment to consume and use and innovate around to, uh, to individuals themselves. So individuals, businesses, governments both become publishers and consumers of these data assets. The Open Data Institute, which uh, I, I've mentioned, um, as I say, um, one of the principal objectives, although the title is Open Data, is to look at how we take whole sets of data classes and asset classes and mix them together. Because very often, it is the open data underlying asset that can add value to some of your own personal information insights, whether that's um, uh, postcode relevant data about crime in your area or transport accessibility or educational attainment, that these things can provide a very powerful context for understanding your own interests, your own um, intentions, goals, and purposes. And this is my one piece of sales pitch. You know, what we're looking to do is essentially provide a place, a meeting place, a, a, a membership model for companies, organizations, public and private, to come together and look at the opportunities in the release of these new asset classes from government, openly, but also what we'll see emerging from the corporate world. So, to kind of finalise, what this provides is, is empowerment for the consumer, but let's re remember that this is about giving a powerful set of capabilities to business. So data providers gain through reputation enhancement. 
one of the reasons people release data is to build trust. You know, it's a very striking fact that the more information that is released between two parties, in a certain sense, the relationship just does become stickier. Data management. Well, of course, you know, this, this is often talked about in, in, in these conferences and others, which is you think you know what you know about your customer until you tell them what you know, and they say that's completely wrong. Okay. Um, so there's an issue around uh, accuracy. There's an issue around reduction, which is, which is, which is uh, too obvious to make, really. Service quality, the enhancement and personalization, because you have a richer contextual uh, conversation with your consumer, your customer. And innovation, that, as Bill Joy famously once said, all the smart people don't work for you. Okay. And actually releasing data back you may well find applications emerging that take your information asset classes that have, the consumers now have and do more innovative things, driving more value actually into your own business line. More insight because you've got a richer resource and just a richer conversation. And on that richer conversation note, thank you very much. Thank you, Nigel. Um, Fascinating. I'm sure that some of the concepts in there will terrify an awful lot of the execs that I know, um, certainly around uh, what it will do to their cost of acquisition. Um, any questions? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Start there. Um, you talk about data as a, uh, an asset, yeah. personal data. Has anyone done any thinking about what happens when that person dies? Can they pass yeah. it on to their family or, or whatever? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, well, that they better had to, and I think that's a very, very pertinent point. What is the digital estate, and uh, how is that managed and handled? And in little bits and pieces it has been, but I think as a, as a complete <coughs> data estate, no. And I think that's, that's a very challenging question, appropriate one. You know, people don't even have a concept of data as property yet, so we've got a bit to go yet. <coughs> Uh, hello, uh, Graham Hobson from Photobox. What, what are the implications for e-commerce companies? And if there are, what sort of time frame do you have in mind? I think the implications are uh, for e-commerce, as you would expect, to be looking at this and thinking, you know, where is this wave going? And do we believe, uh, if you like, data empowerment is something that's going to happen? And do we desire it? Is it important for our business model? In many cases, I would hope and imagine the answer would be yes to that, you know. Um, and then the question is, are we going to be cajoled along this path or are we going to kind of work out what the opportunities are? And at this moment, this proposition is essentially, it's, it's a volunteer-led effort with, with people sometimes who get engaged because there are incumbents who are already well-established in the market with lots and lots of data holdings and the only way they can think about disrupting is to come in and make what was paid for free. Okay? Um, and I think the question is for e-commerce to look at this possible world and say, well, you know, Will we benefit by imagining what our data empowerment strategy might look like? And that's the way I would push it at this stage. Yeah. Time frames, if it ever got to be a power that was enacted, well, a little while. Who's going to go first? Um, uh, so, fascinating presentation, absolutely. Uh, Peter from Orange. Uh, are you planning on the transparency bit? Are you planning to <coughs> define data attributes that you want? from every single telco, utility, how far are you going to take I think what we've been trying to do on the My Data Board is get those groups to work together to agree what those common sets of attributes could be, and because that's much more powerful. If a, if a you know, telcos might not, they will have their own analytic assets that they absolutely want to keep locked down, and some of the attributes will be attributes that have been derived through analytics. But the core transaction data, if you will, and the, uh, the, the, the data that is in some sense being gathered from, um, an emitted bag. That ought to be possible, we believe, in areas like banking, finance, credit, um, telcos, basic retail. What's going to be on an e-receipt, for example, uh, to get some agreement? And if there were, it'd be much more powerful because the friction would get taken out of the, the opportunity to data share if, if a company so wished. Yeah. Fabrizio Liberali, Vodafone. Um, in your model, who do you see in the medium and the long term to be a permission and a consent man management broker. Because if you aggregate <coughs> this data and make them available, then you have different contexts that by themselves, they are not 
dangerous and not risky, like location-based information from telco and payment information from credit card provider. Mm. But then if you aggregate them in a model, who is in your model in the medium and the long term, the broker of permission and consent? So the, the fundamental, it's a good question. In fact, the interesting thing about the, the, the concept that's being put forward in terms of the consultation is that it would not be a power under the Data Protection Act it, because that's a European directive and we don't want to go there. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a power under the, under the Enterprise Bill. Uh, the idea is that this would be, the permission-based initially has to be consumer-centric. So I have to give my permission for my data to be shared more widely. So it's an opt-in. There will be issues, I think, around the larger aggregate insights that can arise. You know, it's the same issue that do people understand the consequence of giving away or their information being harvested to their own kind of targeting? Uh, and I think this is a, a part of a much bigger conversation about where do regulations, where do social norms exist about who's expected to grant what permission? And I think... Whenever this becomes a real public issue, the public kind of has a view that it should be them. <laughs> and then they go quiet for a while, and then it comes up again. So I, I'd like my data to be fundamentally focused around the patient, the citizen, the consumer. Because you know? it's easier to, uh, to get the permission based on this level of information disclosure. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't have people signing up to other standards of sharing when they go to a site. But for the return back, and then what happens to that with third-party aggregators, I think I would imagine that being consumer-centric. 